As part of our series of pre-election segments, we turn to the race for the District City Council seat being vacated by Andrea Campbell. Our guest is one of several candidates in District 4, which mainly includes parts of Dorchester in Mattapan. We'd like to welcome a lifelong Dorchester resident with experience in public health and violence prevention, Leonard Lee. Thank you very much for being with us, Leonard. My pleasure. Great to be here, Chris. Thank you. Leonard, uh, as I mentioned, you have a lot of experience serving the community in various ways. So why decide now to try to do that as a city councilor? Well, Chris, there's a number of reasons, uh, but one in particular uh, is that the city's going through a, a huge transition of leadership. And history becomes important in terms of being able to build and uh, to service the community in ways that it needs to be serviced. And, you know, I, over the years, I come to the table with a lot of resources and relationships. And as you know, relationships are key in terms of being able to move things forward. So uh, uh, those, are, those are a couple of the reasons why, but one in particular is that, I, I, you know, there was a situation that happened in front of my home um, about almost two years ago where a young man was killed by the police and we were trying to talk him down. And it was three of us, two police officers and myself, and the young man had a Glock in his hand. He was petrified. And I, I've seen so, I saw so much compassion from the police as we were trying to talk this young man down to putting the, the gun down. To make a long story short, uh, the police officers had to uh, shoot the young man and he died. And it said to me that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, having a background in youth violence prevention and, and writing a number of policies, I said, you know, there's not time to, to sit back, it's time to talk and mentor and be out there once again to uh, help save some of these, children, these kids' lives. The young man could have been my son, my neighbor, my cousin, my nephew. And I thought I took on a responsibility to myself. And I know people have told me this is not your responsibility, but it is our responsibility to care about young people. And I believe if that young person had a person in his life and said, you could be better, he would be alive today. So that's, those are some of the reasons why, Chris, I, yeah. I think it's important for somebody like me to run. Uh, one takeaway from that incident is you, you can come at it as a mistake for which a police officer would be held accountable. Another way, I guess, maybe is you say, how could you avoid putting the police officer into a position where a mistake or at least something bad could result? Mm. No, correct. You're, you're, you're really correct on that. But, you know, the police, it's interesting because they get they, they, they get a bad rep on some end from bad officers. But I, these two officers showed so much compassion it was amazing for me. And it really was life changing for me because we, we all did not want to see this young man die. Uh, he just, he was lost. So again, I saw two exceptional police officers show exceptional compassion around a highly volatile situation where the young man was, was um, he was confused. He wasn't wilding out, he was just scared. I mean, I was looking in the whites of his eyes and, and he was just scared. Um, he wasn't shooting all around. He was just scared. He was in a situation where he felt, you know, uh, he didn't know what to do. So again, you know, uh, it was one of the things that said to me, we just got a ton of work to do in relationships with police and it's not just one way. You, you've done a lot of work in violence prevention. Is this mainly about um, doing it better by trying to reach the people who are lost or, or do we simply need the, the police to do more legwork on the non-fatal shootings, which play into the cycle of the fatal shootings? Well, I, I, I think we have to get back to community policing. We have to get back to relationship building between the police and the community. We have to get back to understand, uh, uh, you know, you take on the responsibility of being a, a, a peace officer. Uh, what does it really mean? Uh, I think one thing that's missing when people have these conversations about reform and stuff like that, someone was racist before they put the uniform on, they're still going to be racist once they put the uniform on, unless they're getting some help and trying to overcome that. First, identify that that's what, who they are. Uh, and I think we don't do enough of that in terms of screening officers uh, coming into the police force. I think if we do that with, with a social conscious eye, I think we'll get, we'll get better officers who can relate to the community more um, and, and, and build those relationships that are crucial. Another overlap with violence is uh, mental illness. You've done work to try to advocate for, for 
for better access to treatment. What does that mean for what you can do as a city councilor? Well, it, it means uh, working with the Department of Mental Health and Boston Public Health Commission in ways and not looking at people as, as, as perpetrators, but looking at them as victims of a situation because they have mental health and being able to provide a holistic service for these folks become really, really important because they're under a lot of trauma and stress. Uh, 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 it could be from substance abuse, it could just be due to trauma and stress that the mental illness is really elevated. Uh, I think it's really, really important to make those uh, uh, relationships with the Department of Mental Health and uh, Boston Public Health Commission and others. Uh, we're in a, we're in a, a, a bed full of, of, of educational institutions and a couple in particular who focus on mental health and mental health outcomes. I think those type of relationships become much better um, as we start to bring them into the community to, uh, to bring about some really positive things. If we go back about a year ago, you were one of the early uh, visible advocates of wearing a mask during the pandemic. And I know this is a time when it was hard to find a mask or you, it was, you couldn't even buy one, even if you had the money. But, um, what, what was the, your, your mission here, really? What were you trying to do? Well, you know, I was, I was down at Newton Square and uh, I, 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 this was the beginning of the pandemic. And I saw this guy selling masks and they were like four for $10. I mean, the mask that cost 19 cents. And I thought that was ridiculous. And I said to myself, what can I do to be proactive? Having a public health background and, and, and knowing that in communities of color, they have a high pensiony or existing conditions that really elevate the chances of them getting COVID. I said, why can't we make masks free? Masks should be free. They're not like a jacket or a pair of shoes or something you can go without. You might, your feet might be cold, but you're not going to die. If you don't have a mask, you could die. So I went on Facebook. I, uh, I, I hit up 2,732 of my friends. And I said, can you give up coffee for a day so I can buy masks and give them out free in the highest hit areas of COVID? And the next thing I know, it turned from 5,000 to 10,000 to 20,000. And then uh, uh, Boston Magazine did a piece on me and more donations came in. And it's been rolling ever since. It's been amazing because I didn't think it was going to go as, as high as it's done. I mean, we've done over close to 250, 300,000 masks. Uh, we were able to even uh, spread it over to Springfield. We have masking uh, the community in Springfield uh, and Worcester. And I got a call from a number of people who live in, in uh, my district who happen to be from the Caribbean, Jamaica in particular. And they called me and said, can you help me get masked to Jamaica? Uh, I made a connection and we, we did Jamaica. Uh, as you know, Chris, uh, St. Vincent just had a huge volcano. I got a call, I was able to donate another 80,000 masks to them. Um, it's just been it's been it's been snowballing from the beginning, and it shows it shows the love of people and humanity because people just came out of the woodworks. Uh, I tell you a brief story. I, I was in Echo and I was in Lexington, and uh, a woman who went to high school with me saw a piece in the Globe, and she called me up and said, "What can we do?" So she got together. They call it Wellesley Masking Wellesley Newton and Lexington. Uh, and they made over 2,000 masks to distribute to frontline workers here in Roxbury, Georgia, and Mattapan. Amazing, utterly amazing. So that humanity has been coming out in droves around uh, supporting and helping people. So that, that that's where we're at now, and and we're still passing out masks. You know, as early as yesterday, we were out passing out masks in the community, uh, knocking on doors, uh, um, Morton and Blue Lab, passing them out as people stopped at the red light. So we're still going with it until this thing is, until we totally beat this thing. Well, even before the pandemic, uh, people in this district that you're running in, they were feeling increasing pressure in the housing market. Uh, now with, with many people struggling with job losses from the pandemic, uh, anything that you have in mind about efforts to protect their housing in some way, at least till uh, people can recover fully? Well, uh, you know, Chris, when, when America gets a cold, uh, the urban centers normally have a fever, and you're absolutely right. When 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 uh, the pandemic is let down, they're still going to have the issues around uh, being able to seniors being able to afford the taxes. I know uh, our past mayor was working on some things uh, to lower the taxes for seniors and stuff like that. But you know, uh, taxes have quadrupled in some cases, and as, as me going in as a city council, that's one of the major things that I will be definitely fighting for because it's really important to keep people in their home. 
It's really, really important. And then around affordable housing, really having affordable housing that's really affordable and really working at that. And I have some, a bunch of ideas. I, I Friends of mine who are developers and stuff like that, and I would always go back and forth with them on how can we really make this thing work? Again, having those relationships and really having some real good ideas that will really benefit the community and people can live at home and stay at home and they can live in their community that they were born and raised in becomes really important as a city council. Does Boston need to go as far as trying to bring back rent control, which admittedly would face a barrier in the state house, but there are people who are pushing in that direction. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think we can go into models like, uh, uh, you know, co-ops, uh, having co-ops, which have been somewhat successful in New York and other cities. Uh, I think we can have a, 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 a section, a, a type of rent control that could be effective and efficient for people so that they would not be displaced from their homes. Uh, again, there are a lot of models out here in this country that are working. And I don't think we should reinvent the wheel. I think we should do the research that's necessary and bring it to our town because we're, we're no different. The only difference is the personality of, of the will. And I think having the will is half the battle of being able to bring some really great ideas that, that are working in other places that have the same demographics and the same economic situations as Boston. Finally, any, anything you'd like to see to help students in the district with educational recovery? Oh, yes. Uh, in this district, there's a, a number of kids on IEPs and special needs. Uh, and, and just regular students, I think it's really important that we, we all are involved in that process to make that happen. And when I say we all, I, I'm taking it from the schools, the parents, uh, the teachers, um, um, the administrators, um, the politicians, the neighbors and friends. Uh, I think we have a school system that has the possibility of being the best school system in the country. But again, it goes back to the bill. And I think um, in this district, one of my goals is that this, this district will be the example for the city. And that takes a lot of work. That takes a lot of service. That takes a lot of working with the constituents and, and, and being available to bring about those changes and being able to listen. Uh, to get things, you know, bring in the people to City Hall for real, for real. Really well, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Our pleasure. I really enjoyed it, Chris, and I appreciate you. Good to see you again. Candidate for Boston City Council in District 4, Leonard Lee. We'll have more news in just a moment.